Because that third question now has Africans wherever we're going to be geographically on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. And having been ensconced in these places now, because this, this how do we begin the study of the African experience, gives us our frame. The preserving and affirming of African life, how do we preserve and affirm our ways of life, takes us from the origin of humanity all the way down to now. Because this last 500 years has been a period of resistance. And in fact, we might as well go on and do our, finish our recap on that very quickly. So, how do we, before we get to question three, preserving and affirming our ways of life presumes that we know those ways of life. And remember, one more time, as we go to, this chalk is so cheap, but it works. <laughs> Keep chalk, Stone Age technology. I believe in it. All right, anyway, so this, of course, is our Kikongo cosmograph. So the Kikongo people, and they're not the only ones, but the Kikongo cosmograph has a, uh, it, it's a symbolic representation of how the people in uh, Kikongo, I'll write this uh, quick Africa here with Yakutra Moss and little things. Kikongo people down here in Angola, a little bit north of that as well in Congo, a little bit south of that in Namibia. But the point is that the Kikongo people here ha had designed this as a visual representation of the cosmos. The sun rise, the sun at noon, the sun set, the midnight sun. And every cycle, whether it be a day, whether it be a human life, whether it be the life of a group of people over a period of time, follows in this order. And everybody who comes behind has the benefit of those who came before them getting that knowledge from them as they rejoin the ancestors and come back from the ancestors. So every one of these cycles we see go forward. And to finish the analogy that we went over again last week, we might as well finish it up by saying that if we take every one of these repetitions, if we take as a unit of analysis that 500 years, so every 500 years, we say, we're just using this now as a way to kind of put some context on it. We complete a cycle and come back and complete again with the memories of the cycles that come before. And if every 500 years equals one hour, then the period from 1500 to now is one hour. And if we then take that 500 years for one hour and start and say midnight tonight is 2010, or 2000, 2010, we rounded up a little. And then go back, that means 11 p.m. is when? 1500. That's everything there. That's Columbus. That's everybody that comes this way in terms of the, uh, the, the major enslavement of African people in the Western Hemisphere. So then what about 10 p.m.? That's 1000. There's no England. There's no England. But however, if we look at, if we look at our maps, for example, maps number... Let's look at maps seven and eight. Seven and eight, what do you have in terms of enslavement of African people? Trans-Saharan slave. Trans slave trade, exactly right. So there are others involved in this process before Europe comes and says, oh, give me some of that. Some of that what? Some of that black labor. Europe comes back into Africa. I mean, well, I guess you really can't consider the Greeks and Romans Europeans. They only become Europeans in the so-called European Renaissance when people go back and invent an identity to give themselves, you know, big up themselves. But Greece and Rome have been there, of course, many centuries before. But around 10 p.m., you've got a trade in enslaved Africans coming over the Sahara, which, of course, in Arabic means desert. So don't say Sahara desert. That means desert, desert. But you can say that by 10 p.m., you've got folks engaged in the trade of African people. But it's not... England. It's not Spain. It's not Portugal. It's who? Some of the Arabic folk, some of the Muslim countries, and there's contestation. But what happens is there are roots to trade enslaved Africans in coming out of Sahara, coming off the coast of East Africa, coming out of Northeast Africa, going this way into what now becomes Asia, going even up to the lip of the so-called Maghreb to the Mediterranean Sea, and then from there, other points. You see then the trade in enslaved Africans. So what Europe does is come into a process that had already begun. But it's only on our clock two hours old, meaning only two times around this. And for folks who start African-American history with Martin Luther King, Understand, they, they're talking about the period from like 1158. Got two minutes of knowledge walking around. Can you imagine having two minutes of knowledge in your life? And not even a good two minutes. Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Yeah, he gave that speech like a few weeks before in Detroit. There's a record. Barry Gordy had a little record company that he had on the side of Motown, and he pressed the speech. So, in fact, when I got my first copy of that album, I played it. I'm like, that's the same speech he gave. But if you know the black church, you know that black preachers don't never give a speech 
only one time. Negroes give the same speech. And some of y'all been to church, and you could tell, you could tell this, hey, here they go. All right, you ready? Here you go. He's going to talk about all day, Saturday night, all night, Saturday night, all night. And then early Sunday morning. And, uh, all right, you ready? All right, here's where he hits this one. Here he goes, here he goes, here he goes. Anybody see Eddie Long Sunday morning? <laughs> y'all see him, right? Y'all watched him. I watched him on I was like, man, bishop. First of all, when did they start making everybody a bishop? That's a whole other conversation. But at any rate, we'll get there. That's about a month and a half from now. Because these bishops on this clock go back way before 10 p.m. If you look at black religious tradition. What's going on at 9 p.m.? What time is that? 500, right? So-called AD. Meaning what? There's a lot of stuff going on in Africa. In fact, if we look then at our maps, you're not going to see, in fact, map number three, Africa is peoples before European intrusion. Map three is going to give us a glimpse of what's going on, right? And it doesn't even name the major state formations, because most people in the world are not living in so-called empires or big states. They're living in villages, they're living pastorally, they're living in smaller arrangements. In fact, it only happened in this modern era, very recently, that over half the population of the world, or roughly speaking about half, lives in cities, as opposed to towns or, or villages or, you know, the countryside. But that's all right. You see, Africa, in fact, gives birth to humanity and then is quite well fortified and arranged on the eve of the so-called enslavement by 9 p.m. So we're not going to go, uh, we've gone over this many times before. Let's just add a couple of, because uh, some of y'all got in your notes. So if we take this 500-year increment and we go back, when did the pyramid, women, when does Greece come into existence? Between 6, 37 o'clock. Okay, so somebody in the sheet comes up, you start talking about Iliad and Odyssey and Helen of Troy and Jason and Argonauts, whatever, Odysseus or whoever you want to call it. Okay, that's very nice. Very nice. Beautiful. When are the pyramids built? African people build the pyramids about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, mind you, Africa been up all day. <laughs> so Greece shows up around 6.30, 7 o'clock, and then, you know, around 8 o'clock, you know, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The noble Brutus hath told you that Caesar was an ambitious man, and if Caesar was ambitious, so t'was a grievous fault, and grievously as Caesar answered it. I never understood why, you know, of course they were British, that's why they had to give the English accents. But the whole point is that Julius Caesar, oh, that's an evening conversation. Black people are tired by then. We done built the pyramids, Cush, Meraway, Mona Matapa, all these societies looking down. What's all that noise up there? I don't know, somebody in the attic up there fighting with cardboard swords with sheets on. Oh, all right, y'all yeah, stop all that noise. But at any rate, but this goes all the way back to midnight the previous day. That would take us back about 10,000 years. And that would allow us to see the African origin, not only of humanity, because that would go back days and even years before that. But just on this one day, if we take 500 years as one hour, you see the African contribution. Now, if we take this as a cycle then, the trick is to get as much of your human memory back from these previous cycles so that in coming to the next cycle, you can apply that human memory to solve the problems of how to stay on the planet, how to help everybody else do it. That's the challenge. So we know then how we study the African experience, we get our framing questions. How do Africans preserve and affirm their ways of life? The first thing we got to know is what those ways of life were, because the resistance took place in the last hour on that clock. In that example, the resistance has taken place over the last 500 years. And when did the resistance stop? Different questions, right? Different kind of answers. Depends on what we mean, doesn't it? It's a complicated question, isn't it? Brother who just made his transition to great political science, great scientist, great political theoretician, Ron Walters, of course, on this campus for many years, asked in his very important book, Pan-Africanism in the African Diaspora, the proper question to ask is not when did black people become Americans or Jamaicans or when did they become Ghanaians or when did they become Londoners or when did they become Brazilians. The question to ask as well, in fact, the first question to ask is when did we stop being Africans? The question is, we didn't. The answer to that is, we didn't. Now, I'm not talking about taking a swab and getting a DNA test to find out where your ancestors came from, but if Western civilization is an idea, why in the world can't everybody else have the same idea about genealogy? Because it isn't mutually exclusive. It's both and. It's not either or. So let's continue. Yes, ma'am. So then what we see... Let me look and see what time we got. We're doing, we're, we're doing good for time. What was it say? Mm-hmm. Well, they have, they have historical memory. Mm -hmm. Well, and, all people have historical memory. Well, the question is, how far back does it go? How far back does it go? Sure. And we want to teach our children in the future. We want to continue to teach ourselves and our children. But they don't have the opportunity because we're still learning. 
So if we think about this, isn't that a human right? What's that? To learn? To learn, not not just to learn, but to learn our history, oh, or not question. not our history because our history is human history, but to know the truth. Isn't yes. that a human right ultimately? Well, that's a good question. Is it a human right for us to know our history, to know human history, for people to know their history? Certainly, Jefferson, Adams, Banneker, Phyllis Wheatley, whose name was Fatima before they put her on the ship named the Phyllis, and she was bought by the Wheatleys. They would probably all agree that that might be what we might call a natural right. But in terms of a social right, in terms of the governance structure we uh, create for ourselves and the social structures that we live in, that is up to the people who live in those structures. Go ahead, you know? Oh, also. And then we'll, we'll win with this one. Um, the last, for the last page on page 20, yes. um, Robinson speaks of the rule of law. Yes. Does he mean literally the rule of law, or is he speaking metaphorically about the white social governance structure? Both. Both. The rule of law, metaphorically, meaning the whole idea of the presence of the law, and also literally, because remember what we talked about last week. When it was passed, the 13th Amendment, and it's still the language in there, slavery, right? Slavery and involuntary servitude, except what? For crime of which the party should have been duly convicted, has been abolished. Meaning what? Slavery abolished? I don't know. <laughs> Ask them cats in the joint <laughs> whether it's been abolished. So yes, it, it's, all, it's metaphorical, but also literal depending on, depending on the context. All right, y'all, since I'm going to see you all again before this, if you all not doing anything this afternoon, uh, uh, Charles Fuller, the brother who wrote A Soldier.